on to the first session of today's workshop, which is on the uh, creation of parliamentary corpora. And uh, I'm handing over to the moderator of this session, Jan Odijk. Jan, please. Thank you, Daria. Uh, hello, this is Jan Odijk. I'm talking from Utrecht. So this first session is about the creation of parliamentary corpora. Uh, most of the papers in this uh, session actually describe um, improvements or extensions of uh, already existing uh, corpora uh, of parliamentary data. There are uh, six uh, participants in this or six papers in this session. Uh, one from uh, the Polish parliamentary corpus by Maciej Rotichuk and Bartolomei Nitoń. One by Stian Rutten Eide for the Swedish uh, parliament. Uh, he is not uh, present at this uh, event. Then there is a contribution about the Icelandic corpus of parliamentary proceedings by, forgive me the, my pronunciation, Steinthor Stein Grimson, Starkadur Barkarsson, and Gunnar Thor Ernolfsson. Um, a contribution about the Czech parliamentary uh, data by ba Barbara Hladka, Matthias Kopp, and Pavel Straniak. Uh, then there is a contribution from the UK Hansard uh, by Matthew Kuhl, Paul Rayson, and John Mariani. And finally, uh, a contribution about the Slovene parliamentary proceedings uh, by Andrei Panchur and Tomasz Ariad. Um, so um, I looked at these papers. I know that most of you could not read them yet, but they are now available in the proceedings. So all these papers papers describe richly annotated, formalized versions of the parliamentary corpora and the work done and described there is excellent in my view. Uh, with uh, Clarin, um, the interoperability committee which I chair, we initiated an activity to get to see whether we could come to some uh, guidelines to harmonize the formats of the uh, parliamentary data, the so-called Parla Clarin guidelines. And I'm uh, I was happy to see that uh, five out of six papers actually mention uh, these guidelines. Actually, some already actually use them three out of six, and also some uh, observe some extensions or modifications that are desired. This is something that uh, we actually want to uh, see, and uh, we hope still to organize a workshop specifically dedicated to this topic, but it has been uh, postponed first because I was too busy with other things, and then because of this uh, corona uh, uh, virus uh, disease. So that will be followed up later. Then I looked at uh, these papers uh, from the perspective of, uh, let's say, I want to use it as a researcher. Can I use it? Well, most of these data are, uh, or all of these data are available for download, but not all the links uh, that are given resolve, unfortunately. Uh, all are also available via web interface, uh, and they offer uh, search uh, query uh, opportunities, but it's mostly for search for linguistic properties. Uh, some use persistent identifiers, only two actually, uh, which I think is really essential because if you just give a URL, that changes and all the time and or they disappear and it's really horrible. Uh, so use persistent identifiers. Two out of six use persistent identifiers. Unfortunately, one of the persistent identifier one of the persistent identifiers does not resolve. It's also important to know what the license is. Usually the parliamentary data themselves are, of course, in the public domain, but we also want to know what the results of the work done by the researchers, uh, uh, what restrictions are there. And only um, three out of six are explicit about this. And uh, another thing, especially important in the context of Clary, is whether there are external metadata. Most, uh, um, most resources are in a TEI, and TEI, of course, has internal metadata inside the corpus. But in the Clarion context, we would also like to have external metadata in the CINDI format, but only two out of six have that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I was asked to formulate some questions about uh, these papers to the uh, presenters of those uh, papers uh, that can be a that are relevant to all, and I came up with these three questions. So almost all uh, papers stress that parliamentary data are useful for many different users, many different research communities, 
and also outside of research communities. Uh, uh, but um, most of the corpora just provide uh, linguistic information. And I was wondering whether they really provide the information, the annotations or links to other sources that are actually needed by all these different users or at least by some different users. Or are these resources just suited for linguists and computational linguists? The second question has to do with the fact that the data, the parliamentary data, are of course continuously growing. Uh, and um, some of the papers also mention that they have a procedure to continuously ex extend their corpora. Uh, so that is, uh, that is one thing. Uh, there is uh, the discussions in the parliament are continuously ongoing. They are recorded, they are um, uh, transcribed. And uh, so this is the one direction. Can we fully automate the situation that those data that come from the parliament get into the formats that we want to have and that are formal enough to work with? Uh, and second, the other way around, all the work that has been done to improve the um, uh, data that have been provided and all the enrichments that are made and all the formalizations that have been made, could they somehow flow back to the original providers? And if so, how should we do that? And uh, if we, if it, if we uh, want to do that, uh, how should we organize it and how should it be implemented technically? So that is uh, the second question. Continuous process in two directions. There's a constant inflow. We want to use them in the research. We, we improve those uh, resources in many respects. So can that flow back? And finally, um, there was a uh, semantic tagging in the UK uh, example. There was a topic uh, assignment in Icelandic. We just heard in the presentation by the Germans that there is also a classification in categories. It was not clear to me exactly what kind of categories. Uh, and that made me uh, wonder, shouldn't we work towards language independent codes for such uh, topics or uh, semantic tags uh, and for other types of tags that are needed? And is this also feasible uh, uh, at all? So these are the questions uh, that I um, pose to this uh, presenters. And I think it's now time to, for the presenters to uh, respond to this. Uh, each will have uh, five minutes to uh, present their work and answer these questions. Um, Daria, can you? Uh, yeah, so. I guess we can first, start right, right away. Yeah, okay, good, perfect. Hi, Jan and all. Uh, this is Maciej, and so the slide is about uh, what's in the paper, but I will not comment on the slide. I'm just trying to answer Jan's questions. Uh, so uh, I'm the first one to speak, so I can I can speak freely, and maybe uh, everyone will then comment on that. So uh, we we all speak from different positions. So there are languages which uh, are already quite mature in gathering and um, processing parliamentary speeches or, or parliamentary uh, data in general. Uh, and there are cases where gathering uh, the resources are still in progress. So uh, the, the Polish case is unfortunately the second one. So we are still gathering data and we are um, just uh, in the beginning of this process. Of course, the, the corpus is large, as you can see, it's uh, 700, um, uh, 000, 700 million tokens or more. Uh, but uh, I still see it as, as the first stage of the whole processing. And um, at such stage, the, uh, our approach is, uh, is probably uh, determined by uh, who is undertaking it. So we are um, coming from the NLP community. So it was computational linguistic, uh, the approach uh, from the very beginning. So we, we all started with uh, part of speech tags and uh, the annotation layers, which are purely linguistic. Uh, and we are concentrating on linguistic information that are produced by uh, NLP tools. Uh, but it still proves useful for research. So recently we had a Polish speaking researcher from Germany interested in higher education policy in Poland in the recent years uh, during parliamentary debates and uh, even with what we currently have our search engine proves very useful. So um, it will never be the case I guess to satisfy all needs because we will uh, have to uh, have different uh, annotation layers for that. Uh, so it's still mostly for computational linguists but I guess it's uh, as a start it's uh, it's, it's quite useful to, uh, to start with. Uh, 
Um, as for the, the second question, the uh, situation now is that uh, we are crawling websites, working fine for, uh, for text. We are lacking information about uh, voting or the metadata about the MPs, uh, which uh, our parliaments should definitely have in their databases. Mm, and uh, if we want to have that, we will have to crawl them separately. Uh, so we don't have any connection, direct connection with them. Uh, but it still depends on uh, which uh, purpose we are trying to serve. So uh, if we are interested in textual data or the data for the NLP, uh, that's, that's enough and that's okay. Uh, and again, I will have to say that we are uh, just starting with the textual data. So uh, we wanted to have it this way. We want to have the text first and then concentrate on uh, the other properties of uh, um, uh, we, which we could get. So for example, the voting or, or, or some additional metadata about who is speaking what. Uh, so we, we are thinking about some cooperation in the future, but uh, uh, again, it's the matter of uh, maturity. Uh, what we planned for our corpus was to deliver the textual version first and then uh, with some documentation, the search engine, some use cases, usage examples. Uh, and even if uh, the usage examples are just for linguists, I guess we could use it to advertise the whole procedure and probably then get access to, uh, to the parliamentary systems to uh, better cooperate with them. Uh, and the, the, the third one or 2B question, uh, are they uh, our uh, enrichments flow back to the original providers? Uh, so uh, with for getting the data, we are cooperating with the two libraries uh, of the Polish parliament because the same and Senate have uh, different libraries. Uh, so we are, uh, they are helping us with getting the data uh, and they are also motivated in getting uh, the data back because they uh, uh, they have some scans, they have paper documents that they are scanning for us and we are scanning some documents for, uh, for the sake of our uh, work. Uh, and they stated explicitly that they want to have our OCRs and corrected text back. Uh, they didn't tell us uh, what they will do with it. I guess if they are saving mostly graphical PDFs, they might be interested in serving the PDFs again, but with a textual layer. Um, this is not, it's not our priority because we just wanted to have enormous amounts of text for our uh, purposes, uh, but uh, they, they uh, will be able to uh, use what we, uh, what we do in their systems. So we are, of course, open to, uh, to such corporations. And we would like to build on that to uh, be able to uh, get some more data and get our systems connected in the future, but it's still not yet the case. Thank you, that's all I wanted to say. Oh, Thank some yeah, five minutes, perfect. <laughs> oh, I was perfect, thank you. Thank you, uh, Next is then the people from Iceland. I'm not going to pronounce their names again. I'm not sure who's going to present, actually. Yeah. Right. I'm Starkaður, Starkaður Barkason. Your pronunciation okay. was very good. Thank you. Uh, so, the first question. Uh, we th yes, we think that our corpus contains metadata that should interest others that only linguists. For example, we have uh, information about the speaker's age, when the speech was delivered, uh, the gender, role in the government or in the parliament, and his or her party affiliation, and did the speaker belong to the coalition when he delivered the speech. And then we have categories and topics related to the speeches. So I think, or we think, that this offers various kinds of uh, analysis. For example, by flagging the genders, you can uh, do all kinds of or various kinds of gender studies. You can compare also between different age groups, political parties. Uh, does the party in uh, coalition speak more often about the budget than if, when he is in the opposition and so on? Uh, yeah, next slide. Thank you. Uh, this corpus is part of the Icelandic Geek Award corpus and that is uh, extended every year. So the plan is to extend this parliamentary corpus every year and it's done almost in a fully automated way. Uh, we have some minor manual things we have to do that takes a few minutes, but uh, otherwise there are Python scripts that we run after the end of each parliament, uh, parliament and uh, they scrape the website. It's working, uh, but 
we should probably in the future be in contact with the administrators of the website. Their website is not uh, ideal for scraping. It's not very well, you know, they don't use attributes. And so there's a lot of regular uh, uh, expression searches and so on going on. It works now, but just a minor change on the website will break the pipe. So probably we should uh, be in contact with them and maybe try to get the data directly from their backend instead of being scraping their website. Uh, we have been in little informal contact with the administrators and I guess that's been helpful for them because we've sometimes found out that uh, there is a wrong name. Uh, a speech was said to be delivered by a person that didn't really deliver it. So we've been pointing them out some errors and uh, but probably we should sit down with them and explain to them what we are doing and uh, find a way how we could collaborate and help each other. And uh, next slide, thank you. Yeah, we use categories and topics. Uh, categories are like, you know, economy or education, they're broad and general. And we have uh, nine categories that have subcategories so in total we have like 33 categories and it would be very easy to code them but it's more problematic with the topics there are a lot of different topics and new one every year we have now already 10,000 topics so it might be a bit difficult to encode them into a no but we will the aim is to at least translate the topics and the categories into english for the hopefully next version but we are excited about the encoding that would be useful. And yeah, I think that's all from us for now. Thank you. Thank you. And, and then the next one is uh, from the people from the Czech Parliamentary Stenographic Protocols. I'm not sure who's going to present. Yes. Uh, hi, here is Barbara Hatka from Tars University. Hello. And hello. So we made one step uh, father since we submitted the final version of our paper so let me start with the with the summary of what we actually published so Parchik is a project on compiling Czech uh, parliamentary data into annotated corpora and we have just published the very first corpus that contains uh, stenographic protocols that record the meetings of and then between 2013 and 17 PS in the title stands for the Chamber of for, for the Czech term of for uh, Chamber of Deputies. The corpus is available in uh, in the Linda uh, repository, and it is searchable in context and they talk uh, services. The, the the corpus contains the metadata about protocols uh, and no other metadata like uh, data about uh, the members of Parliament or about the institutions are not available. Audio recordings are available as well, but uh, they are not aligned with, with, the, with the protocols uh, yet. And we enrich the original data automatically with part of speech text, and also name entities are recognized automatically. And the corpus is published under the license CC0. Uh, we, as a, as a group of computational linguists, uh, we have a rich experience with uh, creating, annotating, and, and publishing corpora. And therefore, we have started uh, addressing the task of compiling parliamentary data, or uh, protocols in this case, uh, from our perspective. So it means that we published the corpus and uh, we made it searchable in context. Context, that is a tool uh, linguists are well familiar with. Uh, then we are aware of the fact that the corpus will be of interest uh, to a wider audience that will require features that context doesn't, uh, doesn't offer. So, for example, to see broader uh, document context. So that's the reason why Parcheck is searchable also in Taytalk, web-based web service. And this tool allows for, edit for editing and editing text. Uh, their annotation and metadata and updating the corpus uh, accordingly. In addition, the, the graphical user interface can be used to customize various properties of the corpus 
So for example, to visualize name entities according to their classes. The second question, so uh, uh, different users or non-linguistic users will definitely ask for more or more information. So that interlinking the corpus with, uh, with other external sources is, is needed. So definitely the goal is to mutually enrich related resources. Uh, we closely cooperate with, the, with uh, our colleagues who focus on creating a conceptual model of the Czech Republic legislative process from the linked open data perspective. So it then it so it means that it is possible to formulate queries over Sparkle and points to get structured data. So for for illustration, when browsing speeches made by a particular uh, member of the parliament, we could ask about party affiliation or about his hair hair voting and and so. On. So in this in this direction on in, in this task of interlinking resources, we are in the process of studying possible solutions. Nothing, uh, nothing uh, else, else has been has been uh, has been published or has been uh, has been implemented yet. And uh, so uh, the parliamentary data is a, is a living collection for sure. So we have to update the, the corpora continuously. And from this point of view, we, we distinguish two types of corpora: so-called stable, stable one, a stable corpora, and live corpora. Uh, stable ones are traditional corpora and live corpora are the collections that keep changing. So for example, the stenographic protocols are constantly being added, either completely new protocols are being added or the old ones are being authorized. So we can approach live corpora in the same way as we approach a source code in a version control system where we revise the code, check out changes, and then we release its, its versions. So in this direction, we just implemented, let's say a prototype or in our development environment, uh, a script for uploading new protocols into TEI doc. So, so this web service enables to, to, to visualize and to make searchable live corpora as well. At the same time, many, many questions arise. So for example, how to, how to turn this particle version of live corpora into a stable corpus, or how to implement various features in searching tools, or uh, also we have to keep in mind uh, the results of research and data analysis over the different versions of a corpus. Uh, they must be re uh, re replicable uh, and, and so on. So, so far we have not talked to the providers of the original data, so they don't know about our result, but we plan to invite them to our tutorial that we plan to organize uh, very soon, ne next month. So that's it from, from our side. Thank you very much. Okay, next one is uh, from the UK. Uh, Matthew Cool is going to present in so Yes, um, so I'm going to be responding to the chair's first two questions and then Paul Rayson is going to say a little bit about the semantic tagging that we use. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief overview describing what we've done. So this corpus construction was based on the Samuels project, which was the semantic annotation and markup for enhancing lexical searches. So this project ran from 2014 to 2015 and part of its research output was to create a part of speech and semantically tagged version of UK Hansard parliamentary transcripts from 1803 up until 2005. Now this corpus consists of just under 1.7 billion token and has been available on Mark Davies BYU corpus interface for the last few years. So the work that we've done here brings this corpus fully up to date and has a creates a fully semantically tagged version of the corpus right up to the present day. And also it provides a corpus, custom corpus interface based on LexiDB, which is our specialist corpus database management system. So this live corpus currently consists of around 2 billion tokens from just under 9 million individual parliamentary contributions. So regarding question one of are parliamentary corpora useful to users other than linguists, our system certainly strives to be useful to a variety of users, as well as corpus and computational linguists. So our system can be utilized by 
political scientists, historians, and content and discourse analysts. Whilst our primary search tool supports a query syntax similar to CQL or Corpus Query Language, along with a concordancer, so kind of typical linguistic methods, we do provide several visualizations to make the data a bit more meaningful for those who aren't linguists. So these visualizations allow you to look at changes in discourse over time through histograms, as well as the ability to generate word clouds for related terms based on the collocation metrics. And beyond this, you can also access metadata within the corpus. Now, this metadata needs to be cleaned up and certainly is our intention in the future to enhance how useful this metadata is by linking it to semantic web data um, so that this content will be far more useful for a wider variety of users. So on the topic of continuous process, we have scripts that can automate the gathering of the latest parliamentary data from the Commons and Lords via Atom feeds, which are available through the data.gov website. So our toolchain is scripted to run on the back of gathering the latest data. This script handles tokenization and pop speech tagging through clause and semantic tagging utilizing USAS. Uh, once tagged, new data can be loaded live into a LexiDB instance, which is one of the benefits of using Lexi that corporate do not need to be static. They can be live and updated on the fly as and when needed. Um, as an aside for that, anyone who's interested in LexiDB, there's a paper in the main LREC proceedings this year. Uh, so in terms of compatibility and interoperability, uh, we will provide our data for download in a TSV format, and there will be a link to that on our interface page. Um, and we also plan to make available a script that will convert this TSV format into the Claren TEI XML corpus format to allow for greater usage and interchange. So uh, now if we could move to the next slide, and Paul is going to discuss some of the cross-language elements of use as semantic tagging. Uh, Paul? Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, just to pick up on question 2B as well, obviously in the Samuels project, we were working with the UK parliamentary ANSARD team. So we're carrying on working with them uh, and hopefully to feed back the output of this work here into their systems as well, if we can. So just to pick up on the third question, which was, shouldn't we work towards language independent codes for this? Uh, well, yes, I'd completely agree with that. Um, to an extent in the semantic field annotation, we're already able to do that. So we're using the USAS taxonomy that's existed since the early 1990s here with the table on the right that I've shown with the English version of that. So for all of the languages that you can see here in the lists that we've published at NACL and uh, LREC 2016, um, the first step of those is to take the existing taxonomy across to the other language and see whether it works and fits for the annotation in that language. So that's very much uh, in existence for those. Um, obviously we'd like to be able to support mapping to other taxonomies. So it's possible that you could map this to the 33 categories in the Icelandic uh, system. For example, I haven't looked at the detail of that, but um, there was the economics and education categories mentioned. We have similar categories in ours. One of the things that we worked on in the Samuels project was a mapping to a much larger 200,000 plus category set in the historical thesaurus. So that's possible, albeit at a certain level of detail. Um, and the semantic tagger relies on the major word class distinctions for a lot of its disambiguation. And so we're using something similar to the universal dependencies core set of part of speech categories. So I think that would be possible as well. Uh, and there's more details on the USAS webpage if people would like to have a look. Okay, so I think that's it from us. Thank you. And the final presentation then is by uh, people from Slovenia, either Andrei or Tomasz, I don't know who. Uh, hello, yeah, can you hear me? Hello, Tomasz, yes. yes. Yeah, Tomasz Agarvitz will be presenting, thanks. <coughs> so as we don't have the papers yet, just a brief uh, account of the paper of the corpus. So the paper described the whole pipeline from uh, acquisition up translation and then how we encoded the corpus, how we annotated it and how we distributed it. 
what is the second version of CPARL? It's the uh, parliamentary debates from Republic of Slovenia, from, well, just before Slovenia started to exist to 1918, and has altogether about two, 200 million words. Uh, there is uh, inside quite a lot of metadata about speakers. Uh, quite a bit of this metadata is not available from the parliamentary website. Uh, so, for instance, links to Wikipedia articles, um, these have been added separately and the whole, let's call it taxonomy of the speakers and their metadata is, is maintained separately, um, at least in the, in the initial stages. Then we have a typology of sessions, uh, etc. cetera, uh, quite a bit of structural and editorial annotations as well. Uh, on the linguistic side, the corpus has been uh, parsed with um, state-of-the-art tools, so apart from the usual, which is part of speech tagging limitization, it is also uh, parsed according to universal dependencies and tagged with name identities. Uh, and as far as we know or knew, it's also the first corpus that has been uh, entirely encoded in the TEI-based uh, Parla client schema. Uh, it's available on the clarin.si uh, repository under CC BY and also under uh, clarin SI concordances. So can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, now about the questions. Uh, does it provide the information, etc., for non-linguists as well? Uh, we think so. We don't know so uh, because we don't have any reports of them using it yet. Um, but it does have lots of metadata on speakers and also on political parties, so it's possible to know when a certain person is speaking, uh, which party they belong uh, belong to, what role they have in the speech, are they the chair or uh, um, a regular participant and so on. Uh, as I also mentioned, there's uh, other metadata on speakers like their gender, when they were born, um, uh, things like that. Uh, but the way we conceived it, uh, it is of course best uh, suited for linguists because that's something we know at least something about, especially under the concordances, right? They're made for linguistic investigations. Uh, but what we did do in addition to making the complete corpus available in TEI is also to have the metadata uh, as tab separated files. So there's two, one is on people giving all the metadata on, on the speakers and the other one is for each, each uh, individual speech as well. Uh, so on the basis of that, if a person is not interested in linguistic content, then that's, that's probably the place to start. Um, there are plans uh, in the scope of uh, the Slovene Daraya project to also mount it and make it available for searching, reading, browsing as a digital library. This will be a TI publisher application in exist uh, database. And the idea is also, this is part of our um, uh, cooperation between Clarin and Daraya, is to interconnect the two versions. So if you're reading it, you can jump over to searching in it and vice versa. Uh, now, uh, maybe this is enough for others, uh, maybe not. Anyway, further down conversions, Annotations could be made if we know exactly what uh, the different users want. Uh, and of course, we would also probably need some financing to do it. Uh, but given that the corpus is downloadable, of course, there's also no, um, no barriers to others putting annotations in or extracting uh, data from it that they would find interesting. So can we go to the next um, slide, please? Uh, could continuous ex uh, extensions be automated? Um, well, not really. Uh, if we want to keep the current level of quality, uh, they can be semi-automated uh, because the sources, in fact, do contain errors and omissions. So, for instance, names of the speakers are not uh, as precisely given as sometimes should be uh, because they can be ambiguous, and this is then manually checked. And the, the raw transcripts also contain duplicates because there's a various um, um, organs are in session and then this can be duplicated uh, uh, across various different files. So these things need to be looked at. Uh, but in theory, uh, with a bit less quality, they could be automated. 
Uh, however, there's a problem with the body that takes care of the uh, transcript, namely that uh, they don't have all that many people and those people are completely busy with what they're doing already. Uh, so, even though they're quite happy to see that the, the C parallel corpus exists, uh, they're not too happy in changing the way they're doing things right now, partially also because they don't have uh, very good support from their own IT department. So, this is something that uh, we would be quite happy to collaborate with, but uh, it doesn't seem that it's currently possible. And then the next slide, please. Um, so do the enrichments flow back? I think the answer kind of uh, uh, is obvious from the previous slide, namely they do not. Uh, of course, it would be desirable, but as long as they don't have the capacity to actually change any of their workflow, we don't see how this could be done. Uh, on the organizational level, and because this is not possible, we do not have any idea how it could be done on the technical level as well. And I'll finish with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now we have had all the presentations of the uh, contributors to this uh, session. Unfortunately, uh, Maria warned me that we are already over time, so there will be no time unless there is a very urgent question to do some further discussion. I must say I uh, was uh, reassured by some aspects of what I heard today, but I'm also a little bit worried by others. So uh, I'm, I'm worried by the fact that most uh, people are just scraping from the website and are not directly cooperating with the uh, parliamentary services. And I fully understand that the parliamentary services have uh, also their strong limitations and are usually understaffed. I think in the Netherlands we have the same problem. I think it makes sense to see whether we can find a kind of model where both can benefit and actually uh, both, uh, the, let's say, the researchers and the parliamentary services that uh, provide the transcriptions that can benefit from each other so that uh, a business case can be shown to the parliament so that money will be made available for that. But that uh, still will requires a lot of work for sure. Uh, if uh, if it's okay, I would then like to conclude this session here. And thank you for all the speakers of this uh, session.